Um, Hi, welcome to It's Going to Be All Right. I'm Clay. And I'm Nicholas. And we're doing this uh, podcast episode two. Who knew that we were going to make it this far? Two episodes already. Uh, amazing. We're, it is amazing. Um, we're doing this remotely. I'm sitting in my home office in Oslo and Nicholas here at home in Fredrikstad. That's right. Yeah, so uh, we're going to have some slightly different audio, I'm sure, because of our recording environments. Um, we're trying to make the best of the quarantine lockdown situation here in Norway, and we decided maybe it's a good time to get ourselves organized. Just to make everybody kind of understand the situation, I am currently sitting underneath a blanket because it was impossible for me to put the microphone inside my closet, which was my... Uh, original idea but uh, I realized that my uh, my closet is inside my bedroom and my uh, son is sleeping <laughs> so we so. <laughs> use the magic blanket uh, the poor man's sound booth and, exactly uh, and it's a it's a pandemic and I'm sitting underneath a blanket <laughs> in my living room so your, what do they call that for kids a comfort blanket or something like that you've got your uh, your comfort yeah, yeah. podcast blanket now yeah Trying to create my own comfort zone, I guess, in in, in difficult times. Yeah, these troubled, crazy times. So now it's mm-hmm. it's been what two about two weeks since the university has closed down, and that kind of put a hamper on our uh, attempts to do regular releases because we shifted gears. And now is maybe a good time to to talk about what we had been doing in the meantime. We've started a YouTube channel as well. So a lot of the work that we've been doing, um, things that are going to be related to the podcast, are actually available for you to go and check out more as like video lecture and tutorial videos on academic writing. And some of the points and things that we're going to discuss uh, in this episode around kind of the pre-writing stage and importance of getting organized are ideas that I've recently just presented uh, end of last week. I think we did uh, the PhD webinar last week on Thursday. So if there's something in here that kind of piques your attention, I'd really highly recommend go check out our YouTube channel, NMBU Writing Center, and you can find a lot of great information. And if the idea is here in the pre-writing and organization episode of the podcast is interesting to you, check out that webinar for some more in-depth and in-detail examples. Don't forget the the academic resource, academic or scientific writing resource portal on Canvas. Absolutely. That one also contains a lot of useful information about um, what we're going to talk about today. Exactly. So if you're uh, an NMBU student or employee, you have access to the Canvas. We've made the YouTube to be publicly available for those who are finding and listening to this podcast as well and kind of want to see more of the nuts and bolts of of what we do. But Mm -hmm. now with the house cleaning out of the way, um, we really kind of spend a lot of time thinking about how we can organize the the things that we do around the writing center. And I think that you and I have some really good points on why writing is so dependent on, why good writing anyways is so dependent on good organization. So mm-hmm. Nicholas, do you have any particular ideas you want to get started with? Um, I think that we should start with um, what you kind of been talking about for at least for as long as I've known you. And you've been uh, calling this, or we've been talking about what people call writer's block. Mm-hmm. And you've been calling that organizational block instead. Yeah. Um, maybe that's a good starting point. I mean, what is a writer's block anyways? Exactly. I always imagined it was this big block of wood that you put on top of your keyboard or on top of your notes just as a procrastination effort to say, oh, I can't do anything. You know, I've got writer's <laughs> block. But, <laughs> or on top of your fingers so you yeah, can't anything, write anymore anything. anyways. And I think that what happens, uh, you know, a lot of people are familiar with the term writer's block. You sit and stare at a blank screen and you've got all these ideas, but you can't, you can't find the words when you sit down to write. Mm-hmm. And this is where I think what, what I've been calling it anyways, organizational block is the real problem because it's not that you don't know what you want to write. It's that you haven't taken the time to organize what you want to write and how you want to write. And so for anyone who has ever experienced writer's block or maybe listeners who are going through it right now, um, I can tell you personally, I'm kind of going through the organizational block at this moment as I'm preparing for a second article. And Mm. the importance of just being really well prepared, getting 
your disjointed ideas formed from something very abstract and loose to something that is concrete and linear. That, I think, is honestly the hardest part of writing. I think that a lot of people kind of forget that they're actually going to produce a product, something. Um, their ideas is going to end up as something, in many in many cases, a physical object. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, I've been, I think we've been talking about this uh, a couple of times. Uh, right now, I'm sitting in my living room and there's a park outside of my house. So if I'm just going to go over there right now and I'm going to try to build a house out of the sticks and stones and all the stuff that I can find in the park, chances are that that house won't keep me warm. <laughs> no, probably and not. It's, uh, and I'm probably going to be quite wet. So to make a functional house, you need to, you know, you need you really you really need to pay attention to detail, and you need to plan everything in advance. And writing is no different. And I kind of like that uh, house analogy. I've used that one before in lectures. That often, really, what you need to have is a good blueprint for writing or kind of a, a blueprint for building a house as well too it's better to know what needs to go where in what place what needs to be constructed first what will be constructed later mm -hmm. so that you can see how all of the parts fit together and maybe one of the problems i think a lot of people try to do is they're trying to organize through the writing process and we sort of work around the idea that the writing process consists of several different distinct stages, and each of those stages is rather cyclical. So you have the pre-writing stage, which is really where a lot of this organization should be going on. You then move into the writing mm -hmm. stage, where then there's a lot of drafting and revising, refining the idea. And then you move into more of the editing, which is the small details, and then the formatting, mm -hmm. which is just how you want to present. But... The biggest part, I, I tell people that about 95% of the work that you need to do with academic writing isn't writing at all. It's pre-writing. Well, mm -hmm. it's not, that's not necessarily to say that there's no writing involved. It's just a very different form of writing. It's looser. It's maybe lists or maybe it's more visuals um, because you have to spend a lot of time just thinking about what makes sense. What order should things go through. And that's really the difficult part is just thinking, coming up with the good idea, the connections, mm -hmm. the how to make that idea make sense to other people. Writing isn't that difficult if you know what you want to say, how you want to say it. I think there's a, a couple of things that, I mean, first of all, a lot of students, they just brainstorm way too little. They don't really think about their project enough. And I think that, I mean, if you're not... Um, if you're not passionate, if you're not interested in what you're writing about, then it's really difficult to think a lot about it, uh, except for like stressful thoughts. But if you're interested in what you're writing about, then it's interesting to think about. Mm -hmm. Then you want to think about it. Then you want to try to make it, you know, you want, you want to try to design something which is neat, which has a good design. Think about it like, um, I know that you are interested in in um, physics yeah yeah and i'm also interested in physics i'm not particularly good at math but i'm interested <laughs> in physics <laughs> and i think that that might make two of us yeah so i, I can't do the math but i'm kind of in, interested in the philosophical implication and aspects of physics i think um but my point is that you can hear all these mathematicians and physicians they talk about um an equation and a beautiful equation and mm -hmm. I think you kind of want your writing to be like that. You want it to be elegant. You want it to be straight to the point, and you really want it to uh, present all the information and all the nuance. And but it still needs to be relatively simple in a way. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's uh, that's at least what I'm striving to do. And that's I'm fortunate that I'm, I'm relatively interested in thinking, <laughs> not thinking about everything, but. You know, uh, it could be, um, let's say, the theoretical framework of some kind of uh, thing that I'm working on, some article or something. And I'm very interested in theory. So 
trying to get that theoretical framework, trying to get trying to get or have like good synergy between the different uh, concepts that I'm going to use. To me, that is very important, and um, I pay attention to uh, to the details. Mm -hmm. And I guess, as you say, you kind of you enjoy thinking. Mm -hmm. Maybe that is one of the. I, I, we all think all the time. I I can't necessarily describe how other people think, but that is a very important pre-writing process is this thinking. And I wanted to go back to brainstorming. Mm. How is it that, like, let's talk about processes. We can sit here and talk about these abstract concepts all day. I know we can do that. But let's talk about something then concrete. Um, if the goal of the pre-writing stage is to take the disjointed abstract ideas and link them and lump them together and pound them out into some linear logical format, Mm -hmm. What is your process for brainstorming to kickstart that process? Hmm. I mean, it depends. I, I usually try to, um, I do a lot of like physical stuff, I guess. I go for a walk. That's, well, that's one of the things one. that I do. I, I have a tendency to think pretty, I, I feel like I, uh, I'm thinking better when I'm walking. Mm -hmm. uh, and also ju just try to keep in like, uh, get some physical activity every day. That also keeps my thoughts fresh in a way um i think i I'm, I'm trying to treat it like um like anything else like let's say that you know that i'm very much into climbing um yesterday i was out climbing and i was climbing on this type of rock that was that is really sharp so today my my fingers are super sore mm. so i didn't do the climb yesterday um but i was close so even though i i want to go back today and try again it wouldn't be a good idea. I wouldn't be able to do it because my fingers are way too sore. Uh, so I just have to wait. Mm -hmm. And my muscles are too sore as well. So I, I'm kind of treating uh, brainstorming and thinking about a project in a similar way that I'm trying to um, to do it like training in a way. Mm -hmm. Like think for 45 minutes, go for a walk, think about it, then take a break. Uh, yeah. So that's one of the tricks that I use for brainstorming. Well, yeah, you can think, you know, if your brain is an organ, uh, organs kind of need a rest as well, too. When you go training and you get your heart beat up, it's good to mm -hmm. let that heart rate come down eventually. You can't be operating at these incredibly high levels all the time. And I like that you'd brought up mm -hmm. being active, that maybe this is something a lot of people don't think about. Their breaks are to go and do physical activities. Think about the number of people who spend time in training centers, in gyms. And I always mm. wondered, uh, I'm, I'm not a guy who goes and trains a lot or, or really that much at all. It always kind of boggled my mind that people would go to these training centers and sit on a stationary bike or a treadmill with just television blaring. And maybe they're doing it because they need that mental break and training is a really big part of their life. But for people working with writing and with research, I've sort of found that having that physical activity as well is a really good time to have an uninterrupted time to think. Mm -hmm. and Most definitely. Yeah. For, for me, I, I really enjoy swimming. And I had been a lifeguard for I don't know, close to 10, 12 years or something like that. So having that peace and calm and just being able to do something that your body can do quite well and give yourself mm -hmm. time to just think things through and v maybe vent out, use some physical energy as opposed to just mental energy. And that I definitely find helps me to connect dots. It, it gives me time to just mull over an idea again and again and again, mm -hmm. the repetitive motion or something, it just kind of allows my brain that moment of peace when I don't always get that at the office, even though I sit in a very, very quiet little cubicle to do my research. Mm. I, I think that um, a lot of people have experienced some of the same stuff. I, I think I heard somewhere that uh, I think he was like the commander in chief of the um, main hospital in Oslo, Rikshospitala. And he used to play tennis for like one hour every morning. Mm -hmm. And then um, things got kind of intense and he didn't have the time to play tennis. 
But he quickly realized that he had to make time for tennis because he got so unproductive. Mm -hmm. So he needed that like physical outlet. And so maybe that's what some people need uh, to be thinking about is what are some of the things that you enjoy doing that maybe you're good enough at that no longer it requires a lot of mental attention that it can give you an opportunity to sit and dwell on the thoughts that you are having. Now, mm. th of course, that doesn't work for everybody. Some people really find other ways of brainstorming. Um, I also find it's very great to go and talk to people. When a, a new idea kind of comes up and I think, oh, this might be worth pursuing, can I make it make sense to somebody else? Because if I can communicate it verbally in a way that, you know, my, my colleague sitting next to me or uh, to go and walk over and talk with you at the Writing Center, Nicholas, or our former mm -hmm. colleague, uh, Bill Warner, I'd go talk with him an awful lot, especially people who were not within my field. It was really a good opportunity to see if I understood it and if I was forming an appropriate and logical connection that made this sort of abstract idea more real and more concrete and more logical and getting some feedback from people. I've also found that to be quite useful, just talking, clarifying That's the idea that way. Extremely useful, and, and it's nice to talk to people within your own field, but also people from all the disciplines, but also people that don't know anything about this at all. Like, I remember when I was working on my master uh, thesis, and my best friend, he was working as a welder. And it was it was a really good kind of exercise to try to explain stuff to him not because he's an an intelligent person um, quite the contrary but he didn't know anything about mm -hmm. discourse theory you know so i just really had to um be really careful about what kind of words that i decided to use mm -hmm. and that was a very good exercise i think I also like making lists. Yeah. Oh, I, I list so much. I've got just everywhere, paper and pens with lists and lists and lists. Uh, for example, um, because I'm working on outlining for a second article right now, well, my first article is kind of being reviewed by my supervisors and some colleagues, and I'm waiting to get feedback on that. I think just to nail down this final structure, something that makes sense. I've been working on this for, oh geez, I don't know, since November, November last year, mm -hmm. 2019. So now we're in March. So quite a few months I have just been reading and listing and listing and listing and listing and page re after page <laughs> and relisting and striking ideas, but all of that. And, and that is part of a writing process even though, and I am writing, all of this goes yeah. down on pen and paper. I've got digital documents as well that I do this on. But I think that that also, I've heard some people say, uh, like a former colleague at the Writing Center used to describe writing as making pottery, sitting around playing with clay, not with me. Uh, I mean, if you want to, I, by all means, um, I, you can come and drop by my office when the university opens again. But you would talk about how you, or maybe like woodworking, you start with a, a lump and who was it who made um, the statue of David, that really famous marble piece? Was that um, Michelangelo? Michelangelo, yeah. I had heard it said that he didn't carve David into the marble. David was already in there. He brought him out. Yeah, I heard that one as well. Yeah, yeah so yeah. being able to sort of chip away and refine by having sort of a a repetitive writing process that you can use that's short and that's simple. Um, this could also be considered free writing, I suppose, where people may write mm -hmm. one or two paragraphs and just dump their ideas, giving them an opportunity to kind of go back and reflect, read over this stuff a day or two later and think, okay, so do these ideas make sense? Is this really going in the way that, that I want it to? But mm -hmm. one thing that I always notice when I come and see you, your desk is just full of doodles. <laughs> You're drawing stuff all the time. Do you do you yeah. find that that kind of makes a good process to help organize and form connections in a different way? Um, yeah. I mean, both yes and no. Sometimes it's just kind of like a mental break, I guess. 
And other times, it's uh, have you heard about a telephone drawing? You mm -hmm. know what that is? Is that the one kind of like the telephone game? You start with something, you give it to someone else, and they add something, and it comes back to you, and it slowly takes form? Or Definitely I... not. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I have, I have no idea. I took a, a wild, unestimated, <laughs> uneducated guess. What it is, is that uh, back in the day when we had like a telephone, you know, not a cell phone, but a telephone. One with the, telephone the one with the cable. In, exactly. And the, the dial-up internet. Exactly. Um, when I was on the phone, and I wasn't really that much on the phone, but when I was on the phone, I would usually like dr make a little drawing because there was it would always be a notebook next to the phone with a pen. Yeah. You could write down like messages, you know, small notes, someone stuff calls like for that. your mom or dad. <laughs> exactly. And I would always make small drawings and my mom would always make drawings as well. So I think that's kind of like a part of the process. Uh, I have a tendency to think better when I draw. Mm -hmm. So I remember when I was a student and I was like listening to a lecture or something, I would usually just sit and draw and people would, ah, oh, you're not paying attention. But you know, that, that was just kind of, it works for me. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I make... We, st we started to talk about lists and I'm, I'm really into making lists. And I'm also, I have this pursuit. I really want to make the ultimate list. <laughs> you, know, you really want to like start, you want, you want to relist things and you want to kind of condense it and refine it and create like the, the, the ultimate list. The perfect list. Exactly. The perfect Squeeze list. Squeeze down to its essence, everything that needs to be there. <laughs> exactly. And it's just, it's just perfect. And sometimes it turns into like a mind map with some arrows and stuff. But then I might have to redo it because I'm not uh, happy with how one of the arrows might look, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but this is just, uh, I always write these lists. They, I, I like to do, um, um, you know, like handwritten notes. I don't make lists on my computer. Yeah. Not that many, at least. I'm actually looking at a list that I made on a computer right now, which are my notes for this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> but usually I, I like to to do them um, uh, physically, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Pen and paper. And now, if, if this was something that we could show to people, um, it's also really interesting because we're talking about organization. We're talking about processes that people go through and how not everyone necessarily takes the same approach. You can really easily see from our list because we're using a shared uh, Microsoft Word document, and just the style of how we put things together, how we've organized our own ideas, it is yeah, actually yeah, yeah. really different. Uh, you're quite <laughs> extensive, you've got exclamation marks, you're, you're emphasizing a lot of stuff. Um, oh, yeah. What do I have? I just knowing your purpose, knowing, you know, knowing this, knowing that, just uh, very brief little notes, and then that is just stuff that I've already been thinking about. I, I guess it just sort of, it really demonstrates that there's no one correct way to do this. And you just have to follow your heart in a way, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and do what, when it comes to do what makes sense. If it doesn't make sense to you, it's then it's not your writing process. You're trying to like fit the, the square block in the circular hole. To me, it's kind of like, if I kind of, um, to a certain extent, inject emotion into my notes, then I have a tendency to remember them more easily. Mm -hmm. um, and I also want to talk a little bit about note-taking systems, because that is very like closely related to making lists and, and brainstorming and kind of just uh, the whole pre-writing stage. Definitely. Um, and we are kind of... There's one note-taking system that I've been talking about quite a lot, uh, um, you know, in lectures that I've done for the Writing Center, and it's, you know, you create, like, a category, um, and then you put in stuff from different articles or books you read under that category. That category, it could be could be anything, but let's say um, climate change effects or something like that, mm -hmm. right? And you include uh, the full reference, page number, author, everything. And you try to paraphrase it and... If you want to use the, um, exactly what's in the book, then you put it in quotation marks, mm -hmm. right? Like a quote. Um, that's a pretty good system. But I remember, I think we've been talking about this a couple of times before, but 
I kind of made my own system when I was a student and I started out with like some really bad systems. And <laughs> my first system was, I think a lot of people do this, but you read a book and then you have this like big yellow marker. Yeah, like the old yellow. The old highlighter. The old highlighter, yeah. But I didn't have that one because I'm not that sophisticated. I only had like a, a pen. Um, so I would like, you know, mark different stuff in the book, underline different things. And that kind of, I kind of extended that system. So I would add like a little symbol next to the sentence that I uh, thought was interesting for some kind of reason. And I so I created this kind of like a, my own alphabet. It was like a star, an exclamation point. It was different um, symbols, but it just ended up being confusing. And the problem was that I had to find all this stuff in the book. Yeah. You've yeah. read it once, and the last thing you want to do is go back and read the same document again. Now that, I mean, exactly. that's totally different with books and movies, but when it comes to research, oh, I, the last thing I want to do is have to go and muddle through a lot of what I have already read. Now, and, the and disasters... It just, it just disappears, you know? Yeah. And I mean, it's a, it's a good start. Like, I have certainly realized from coming out of high school and going into university in Canada and then coming to university in Norway and moving through programs and working as an employee and all of this sort of stuff, my process has definitely changed a lot. I used to be one of these mm. people who, okay, you know, term paper, not a problem. I'll just read and form the ideas while I read as I'm writing the assignment. And I was always smart to do this many days or weeks before the deadline. I only ever pulled one all-nighter, and it was the worst. I never, ever want to push deadlines that far again. It was terrible. I actually but, never done it uh, because I'm, I, I don't recommend yeah. it. <laughs> Been no, there, the, done that. Well, once was enough. But, I just think I uh, yeah. I, I'm just gonna let you finish. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, inter interrupt any time that you want. I really don't mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 do, I don't want to do that. So for me, the process has really changed. I've started to categorize that as I read, I think a big part of what helps me to form good writing is interacting with what I'm reading. So I'm not just mm -hmm. doing this sort of passive reading and highlighting or underlining things with the expectation that I'll remember it because I probably will, but I won't remember where it is when I need to cite it. Exactly. So I... I put a lot of comments in the margins. I really like to print stuff off. And I know a lot of people who can do this digitally, and that's also a good way to do it. But putting comments and questions, like what does this mean? How can this support the statement or the argument or the paper that I'm currently researching and writing or preparing to write? And once that article is done, I, or even sometimes while I'm reading the article and listing these ideas down in the margins, I have another document on the side, usually on the computer, where mm -hmm. I kind of categorize everything. Uh, there's a thematic topic. What is it that if I could summarize this paragraph or these three different highlighted areas and my comments on them, what would the common theme of that be? I build all this and that is then turned into making sure that every one of these little notes pages that I take has a full citation and reference, so I don't have mm. to worry about referencing later. And it's been really helpful. I found I've started to stagnate a little bit, so the last two weeks I've been reading and just margin note-taking, mostly mm. because I had a pretty good idea of what it was that I was looking for, and I'm not trying to build a huge amount of additional notes to rely on so much as trying to just read through a bulk of documents to the point of saturation, but to sort of make sure that I have the right idea. Mm -hmm. And now, actually, I, I will go back and I will reread these articles, at least the ones that are really good, and reread the sections based off of the notes that I took inside of them to pull out the information that is going to be relevant for this article. So that has sort of changed a little bit, but that's maybe also because it's so much further ahead in that organizational process. Uh, the ideas from listing and note-taking earlier have provided enough of a structure to allow me to know what it is I really need to extract. And all of that has just really come from months and months 
of working on this and years and years of developing a system that starts to make sense for how I can organize and how I work. Definitely. And just like kind of story time again, um, like my system with um, marking stuff up inside the book and, you know, using different symbols and stuff, that kind of just ended up being confusing. So I discovered that, okay, I just have to write down stuff from the book. So I was like, I had this kind of approach that I was reading and then I was on my computer and I was writing stuff down at the same time. The problem was that it was it kind of ended up being really difficult to know what was important and what was not important because I wasn't really reading the book with any kind of specific um, intention. I didn't. Uh, I wasn't really seeing it through uh, like a specific lens, mm -hmm. if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. I wasn't reading it critically. I was just kind of reading and trying to figure out what was important at the same time. And sometimes everything just seemed important. So I, uh, the notes got way too extensive and got really difficult to navigate. Yeah. So then I kind of had to change my system uh, or evolve it, you know. But I discovered at a pretty pretty early stage that it was a good idea to write down crucial information about the source that you that you're using so mm. it's not difficult to find it again because i mean i remember i um kind of like having a, a treasure map <laughs> exactly i screwed out that one up the first uh, time i wrote a term paper i think and i was just like desperately looking through the books and trying to find the sources and where i taken stuff from it, it was a nightmare so i'm not going to do that again <laughs> and I mean, maybe that works for some people as well. What you talk mm -hmm. about of taking notes that are way too extensive, I think that that is just a byproduct of being very early in the research process. You don't really know what you're reading for yet. You're build True. And that's part of it. That's why this writer's block or the organizational block is such a hazard for people because they may still actually be in this stage of really trying to figure out what is it that I want to write? What is it that I am going to be communicating? And it's, it's not a process that is necessarily linear, and it's not a process that runs on the same time scale for everybody. Some people can have a very clear idea based off of the research topic and their current and you know, expansive knowledge on the subject already. Other people need to dive into whole new fields. Other people just take longer to think about things and kind of generate that eureka moment. So I think the important thing that, that anyone who's actually listened for this long and is sticking with us, it's hard. But this is the work. When you sit down to write, it's that's the fun part, really. Mm -hmm. uh, that's true. And I mean, um, you told, you just... Um, you talked about pulling an all-nighter, writing for an entire night, 24 hours probably, uh, to be able to, you know, create something um, that you could turn in. I mean, I've always been, um, I kind of discovered relatively early that I was, I was working pretty slowly. Um, I was writing, it took, it, I spent a lot of time just kind of uh, trying to figure out what I'm going to write about and then create a really neat theoretical framework and then it took be a long time to write because as I talked about in in the first podcast I wasn't really that good at writing so I you know took me a lot of work um, so I could never kind of just pull off a, a you know a all nighter because I work too slowly mm -hmm. <laughs> and that is so I think yeah just the time management that that comes with the process Definitely. of getting organized as well. Uh, we could look at it this way. I'm sure that we all know someone. Maybe we have a partner. Maybe we are that person. Maybe we have a family member who is like this. It takes them forever to get ready to leave the house. Yeah, I know. You know, it, someone. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, I'm the kind of guy, you know, uh, two minutes in the shower is probably good enough. Brush my teeth, you know, 15 minutes and 15 to 20 minutes and I should be ready, fully clothed and prepared to go out the door. Oh yeah. I mean, does no it problem. mean that I'm necessarily the, the best dressed or the most elegant? Well, probably not. I could, I could spend more time on those things if that were important for me, if yeah. that were a part of my process. 
Um, and other people need to take a lot longer because their intention is different and their expectation is a little bit different as well. I think um, I think a part of this process is to develop some kind of understanding of your own um, workflow or tempo. Yeah, I think that is very important when it comes to time management. I mean, if you know that you're a slow writer, then you should you know you should definitely um, schedule a lot of time for that. Yeah, start and to early. Me, that's been crucial. Yeah, start early. I, I usually just I started like the first day of the semester. Like, okay, now I'm gonna just start reading and taking notes and I know I'm gonna write something at some point anyway, so I'm just gonna start now and I'm gonna try to find stuff that I find interesting as fast as possible. Um and that helped a lot. And I just wanted to um I told you this story before, but an old colleague of mine we were having like a conversation during lunch and he was he was reading some really complicated german philosophy um from the 19th century and he was um he was like oh this is so difficult and if i'm not fully concentrated all the time i'm kind of just missing important details and i'm not kind of getting the big picture so he decided to go to his cabin um away from his kids to read this philosophy and try to write an article so his process was he got up like six in the morning and he would read in the bed for a couple hours then he would read a couple more hours and then he would write after 12 and he told me like you know some days it feels like my head is a toothpaste tube with a really small hole and i'm just trying as hard as i can to squeeze out just like a tiny bit of toothpaste which you know is obviously words uh for him it was difficult to write and i think that if he had um if he had paid more attention to like the pre-writing stage to organizing his thoughts then the writing would probably be a lot easier yeah and that's a really good point that the harder you try to force it the less likely it's going to be productive, the less likely it's going to be useful for you. Mm -hmm. And I guess this is why people go on writing retreats so that they can get that peace of mind and they can sit down and finally have the time to write. Mm -hmm. And I haven't actually been on one of those myself because my practice is more to, like we've already talked about, have daily writing, just listing, putting down ideas as they come on post-it notes uh in on notepads anywhere that i can so for me the need for like a writing retreat is way less helpful for me in my process because there's actually a lot of writing in the pre-writing stage that helps me to organize everything into an outline and so a lot of this oh, yeah. is, so I'm taking notes and I'm structuring these notes in a way that's easy for me to find, that's easy for me to filter through, that has all of the necessary information based off of the purpose of what I'm trying to write about. Mm -hmm. And that's all digitized. So it's really easy to grab. But what I spend a lot more time on is once I feel like I've hit that point that I'm, I should be able to start writing, I should be able to make an outline, I actually will spend months just working on that every day, thinking about it, going for walks, going for a swim, talking with people, and just writing down lists, writing down notes page mm -hmm. after page, as I've already said. And that for me is the hard part of it, is just nailing down what belongs, what doesn't belong, what is the flow of the argument, what needs to come first so that what comes next makes sense, that sets my idea apart. And, and here we kind of back to like the, the narrative, you know? Yeah. It's all about storytelling. Exactly. They need, things need to be presented in a logical order to make sense and to be interesting. Um, and that takes a lot of time. And I use like a similar system to you. It's um, trying to organize my thoughts, creating lists, you know, new lists, relisting, relisting, trying to like, again, create the perfect list but also take notes at the same time and, and categorizing my notes. And eventually, maybe, sometimes, that list will turn into kind of like um, an outline of your paper. Mm -hmm. uh, and you could just put all these notes that you've been taking 
into that kind of outline that you have created and then you can start writing and then you can create paragraphs and then you've got all the information that you need yeah because the that is i think the hard part is having the ideas in place it's not having your notes it's not having your citations it's not having your results it's about mm -hmm. having your ideas formulated and mm -hmm. again we talked about this a little bit in in the first episode i i mentioned how some people just don't always tell jokes very well because they don't prepare them or they they don't do the setup right mm -hmm. and that's very much a big part of any type of really effective communication is that preparation stage and again it doesn't matter how you do it it's it's about what works for you it's about what helps you to find the information that you need to link the ideas you know be it mind mapping be it flow charting, be it listing, be it talking to other people, free writing pages and pages of ideas and cutting it down. But also I think a really good point for getting closer to the end of this pre-writing stage is looking over the articles that have really stood out to you. What is mm -hmm. it that you have read that just made so much sense? And what is the structure that they have used? the way that they've presented their ideas, their use of headings, how they've constructed their paragraphs, the flow of the ideas, because that is a really good way for you to really figure out, hey, you know, here's something that I can kind of, like, it's not right to say this in academia, but you can steal that style. Oh, yeah. You, know, you don't, can emulate it. Don't in a plagiarize way. them. Yeah, emulate is maybe the better word, so I don't get into uh, <laughs> any any legal trouble. I'm not saying plagiarize. Don't plagiarize. Avoid that. But you can definitely emulate the styles because that might be another hard thing for a lot of people. Is maybe they know what it is that they want to write, but they don't know the format, and that's oh, what yeah. they end up struggling with. Is sort of I have all of the notes, and I have all of the ideas, and I have the thesis. I you know, I have the hypothesis tested and my conclusion, but like, I just can't make it come out. Well, look at, look at the articles that did those same things that you're trying to do and how are they built up and use them, reflect on them that little bit, see how they are put together. What are the nuts and bolts and the order that they have, have put that in? I mean, this might sound a little bit crazy, but it's, in the end, it's about creating something that, in a way, is aesthetically pleasing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, back to the uh, mathematical equation, like, you want to create an elegant piece of work. That's kind of the, something that is so on point. And just emulating style is a part of that, I think. Yeah, definitely. And it just takes some practice. And it's the same with everything, like... We both we are both into skateboarding, and there you can see personal style is is very important. But that's something that you will develop over time. But you can definitely emulate how a person does a specific trick, or the types of tricks that you Most want. Most definitely, to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because which could be like words that you use or totally. something. Well, just the things that inspire you, the the things that speak to you. And this isn't to say that come the end of the pre-writing process when you've got all of your ideas finely organized and lumped and structured well into an outline with good notes that your first draft is going to be perfect. It's going, no, no. it's going to be far from that. You've now just entered the what I really consider the more fun and creative part where everything is in place. The planets have aligned so that you can sit down and not have that writer's block because you don't face organizational block. You know where you start, you know where you're ending, you know what is supposed to go where, and now it's just more or less kind of like the the feng shui if you want to be all new age <laughs> and, and Eastern philosophy about it. You first, you need to build the house. So you have your blueprint, which is your outline. Then you need to build the house, which is your first draft and it's going to be pretty rough because it's just the timber frames and the foundation and then as you move through every other draft it's adding the walls choosing what color the walls are going to be painting those walls moving the furniture in reorganizing in a way that mm -hmm. becomes more aesthetically pleasing that kind of allows the person who you're leading through 
your house, your reader, to kind of do it comfortably and effectively, and everything is laid out in a way that makes a lot of sense. So it's still, and you have to go with the flow a little bit. Yeah. At that stage, you cannot be too static about it. You have to be a little bit playful, and I think that, um, like that house analogy, it's kind of like. Oh, now I forgot what I'm was supposed to say. Just continue talking, and I'm gonna. <laughs> yeah. Now I, 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 you know, it's back. It came back to me. Um, you know, uh, Maynard from the band Tool. Oh, absolutely. If yeah. you if you don't, you should. Definitely, he's a. He's an interesting guy, <laughs> but um, he's producing uh, wine, red wine. And I heard like an interview with him and he was talking about the process of making wine. And he said that he's extremely good. And he said that he said that he's extremely good at organizing. So the actual he doesn't really work that much, but he spends a lot of time organizing. And that's kind of interesting when it comes to like if you're going to compare that to the writing process, he does a lot of pre-writing, but when it comes to the actual writing, he's, you know, he's planned it out so well on beforehand that it doesn't really, it's not that much of a big deal to him to do the actual production. Yeah. The changes become more minute and Mm -hmm. there's less reorganization that occurs. I mean, we can talk about this in, um, another upcoming episode about how you can more effectively move through the writing process of drafting and revising and and those sorts of things. But I, I'll touch on it by just sort of saying that once I get to the writing process, I expect a minimum of three drafts before I feel like the article is ready. Because I oh, know yeah. that in That's that time... That's a minimum. Yeah. That, and I mean, I'll... I'll even go as high as five drafts before I'm ready to share it with a supervisor or share it with a colleague, because it still takes that time to just further refine the ideas and work more around principles of writing for cohesive and clear communication. And I've found that even having that kind of process in the writing process where I have a specific focus And I think that that's a really important thing that people need to have all along the way from pre-writing to writing to editing to formatting is don't necessarily think you need to do everything at once. Break things down into smaller manageable chunks. Give yourself a purpose. Give yourself a focus, a task that you can complete, which builds to the next. And I've introduced workshops and lectures before saying that, you know, with the writing process, it's a lot like the saying that Rome wasn't built in a day. It's brick Mm -hmm. by brick, but you get there slowly and steadily. And and the important thing is, you know, back to the house and the feng shui and all that, um, I think that once you actually have something, so you've done all the pre-writing and then you write it, you write the whole thing from start to finish or one section of the paper at least, then you have something. It's a physical object that you can manipulate. And that's when you can start to refine it and you can start to focus on specific things. So it could be cohesion, it could be paragraph structure, it could be a lot of different things. But the point is that then you actually have something. It's not on the idea stage anymore. It's something physical that you can manipulate. Yes, and it's it's much easier to get help in the writing stage once you have something real and concrete because people, writing advisors at the writing center can give you mm-hmm. specific tasks to work on to refine your writing. Your colleagues, your supervisors, other people have something that they can read and you know, constructively criticize, hopefully constructively criticize and not just criticize because that also happens. Um, but yeah, if, if you can move things from the abstract towards the concrete well before you sit down to make that first draft, then you're already working from a real tangible object in a way that the words that we write down kind of become that they become real in a way. And I mean, take that any way that you want it, but it, it ends up giving you something that you can manipulate. You can move the individual words. You can change them to find something that has a stronger, more impactful or more precise meaning. And it's kind of, Kind of crazy when you think about it, like how fantasy can become reality. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And just how how much fun you can have with words and structure of ideas and putting everything together. 
that, mm-hmm. again, it's still work, but it doesn't need to be a dreadful or a painful activity. And that, I think, is really, for me, what I've been stressing for many years to people is the more that you can separate these processes, recognize that the abstract thinking is a process in itself, and you shouldn't necessarily be trying to do that in its entirety while you're sitting to write your first concrete draft. You'll still have these abstract thoughts going on informing the writing process when you get there, but that should be more of like a metacognitive, self-reflective abstract process as opposed to trying to formulate and refine the idea to the point that it's worth writing about. So that would be the distinction I'd make. I think you made a lot of these ideas relatively concrete with the, um, when you formulated the revision roadmap. Yes, which I hope we, then, can, we can introduce and discuss uh, for people at, at some point as well. I, I was very happy with how that turned out, but that itself was also a, a long process to develop and realize. And it went through many iterations that you have never, ever seen and nobody ever will because they're incredibly <laughs> bad and embarrassing because so they weren't the, finished. So yeah, so the interesting thing is that the revision roadmap had its own process of being revised. Yes, very much yes. so. And still, like every, it's still being revised. Uh, the way that it's presented in the writing center, since I'm not there full time, um, it's interesting to see how other people have refined it and adapted it, that it it looks quite different. More has been added. Things have been further separated. Um, I've gone and reversed the order that I think the way it's presented in the writing center, it's sort of like a funnel or an an upside down pyramid triangle that you're kind of working to refine. Um, I've since flipped it when I talk with people more around the pedagogy and education, um, because then it mirrors what I was using as a template for it, which is Bloom's taxonomy of sort of climbing the rungs to a higher level, a higher creation of something. Hmm. Um, There are some definite similarities. Yeah, but I mean, it doesn't really matter which way you use it. it, it achieves the same thing, but... Yeah, that was a long time in the process. And I'm still every day working with it, refining it, making it better. And other people, now that it's out there, are doing the same thing for the for their purpose and for their style. I was actually using the revision roadmap a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think, because I had to translate it to Norwegian. And then I had to make some ah. changes because, I mean, English and Norwegian are different in many ways. And some words doesn't really... Uh, work in Norwegian and you kind of have to... Grammatical structure doesn't always exactly. translate, so some of the things that are there are irrelevant for the Norwegian language. Exactly, and you kind of have to do some cultural uh, translation at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the listeners, the, we could just kind of briefly explain what the revision roadmap is about. You start out on the pre-writing stage on outlining your project, and then um next stage is to write from beginning to the end to create some kind of physical object and get all the ideas down on paper and then it's all these different stages of refining the text focusing on um uh, sections paragraph structure sentences and all the way down to formatting at the very end and so it's sort of designed to give a specific goal or target that you can mm-hmm. focus on as you're writing, as you're revising, mostly because in my experience, there were just the, there were so many people coming in feeling completely overloaded. I don't know what to do. My supervisor has given me all of these comments. I don't know where to start. And it was really just for me, a very logical step. We'll start with the big, easy stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. Do you have logic in your document? Let's let's break it down. Let's look at your structure and go away. You've got a task to work on and here are tools and techniques and resources that you can use. Come back in a week or in two weeks, however long it takes you to get this done and let's see where you are and then we can move up the rung to a new focused task. And by the way, uh, the revision roadmap should be able to, um, for all the listeners, uh, you should be able to find it as at our uh, scientific writing resource portal on Canvas, I think. 
So I'll put a link in the show description be, if if you're an NMBU yeah. employee or if you are at a university that uses the Canvas online infrastructure. We also have this available in the Commons section. So I'll make sure that we have a link in the show description for that. However, I'm not sure if the video will come out before or after this episode, probably after, but I do have an intention hmm. to make a YouTube video as well that demonstrates how you can use this revision roadmap, but also how the very same idea is quite useful to apply in the pre-writing stage as well. So bear with me. We're trying to do a lot, working from home, trying to do a PhD, trying to do a podcast, <laughs> trying to create content for the writing center and support our students. Um, it'll get around when it gets around, but there is the Sitting under... Yeah. Sitting under blankets and trying to raise your kids. And, yeah. I mean, we, a lot we, of stuff happening at We the all same have time. a lot of priorities right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, do you have any other than, um, you know, your, uh, your comfort blanket there? Do you feel a little bit better about everything that we have covered today? Definitely. I think um, this episode has come to its... End. Yeah, I feel like we've we've moved to the next stage. We're starting to touch upon the writing process. So maybe it's a good time to wrap this up. We hope that our listening audience was able to get some new ideas on the importance mm -hmm. of the pre-writing stage. And again, I highly recommend if you are an NMBU student or employee, SWR100, the Scientific Writing Resource Portal, is available to you in Canvas. Otherwise, we have migrated a vast majority of the resources that were in video format over to our new YouTube channel, NMBU Writing Center. Uh, you can go there and a lot of these same ideas are either already covered or we will have new material coming out there, more in a video lecture and short tutorial style video. So um, the moral of the story is that pay attention to the pre-writing, take it seriously, um, and work on it for a long time, refine your ideas. And, you know, it's always uh, a good thing to be passionate about what you're working on. Yes, and refine your process. We've talked a mm -hmm. lot about what works for us and hopefully given you some ideas of things that might work for you. There's no one right way. There's no one size fits all. So it's not just about taking the time to refine your own ideas. It's about taking the time to refine your own process. And in the end, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Thanks a lot for <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot for the podcast, Nicholas. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. Talk to you next week. Talk to you next week. Talk to you next week. Talk to you.